Jesus was easily and immeasurably the most successful person in human history in every way. Yet, if we're to measure his lifetime effectiveness using today's church standards of success for like our staff and leadership, Jesus would probably find it hard to get hired on at most churches. Now, sure, Jesus could draw a crowd, usually around healings and massive mealtimes, yet he primarily spent the bulk of his leadership energy and time with only a dozen people. And in our modern church, Jesus would not get great marks here, and he'd probably not get that promotion up the ladder. Senior leadership usually relegates discipleship to lower team members or directors. Sorry, Jesus. Welcome to the Everyday Disciple Podcast, where you'll learn how to live with greater intentionality and an integrated faith that naturally fits into every area of life. In other words, discipleship as a lifestyle. This is the stuff your parents, pastors, and seminary professors probably forgot to tell you. And now, here's your host, Cesar Kalinowski. Okay, here we are again. Good to be with you. Really good to be with you. Man, I'm still kind of buzzing. I just hopped off a Zoom call with one of our coaching cohorts. These are some folks we've been in coaching with for over a couple of years now. And I'll tell you, it's so encouraging. There's so much breakthrough as we always start out our calls by rehearsing evidences of grace, like where you see God just blessing you and unmerited favor breaking into your everyday life and all that. And everybody had so many. And this particular cohort always has a lot of evidences of grace. And we're just seeing so much breakthrough, so much movement and momentum. And they're all in really a lot of different contexts. This is a bit of an international group. And then a whole bunch of them are pastoring churches, but some of them aren't. And it's amazing. Across the board, there's so much more freedom to lead in the ways that they feel God's leading them to and make disciples and see the thing behind the thing, speak good news to those. I'm so encouraged by all of it. And one of the couples from this cohort's on the road right now, kind of heading our way. They've been on this road trip celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, and they're way past retirement age and really making hay in their neighborhood, making disciples in their neighborhood. It's an amazing story they have after living in the same neighborhood for a very, very long time and being really involved professionally in ministry, they've now dug deep into relationships and we're just seeing a lot of fruit. But uh, they're on their way, coming this way, and they're going to be visiting our home for a few days later this week, getting to hang out with Team K. So woohoo! And happy anniversary to Phil and Barb, 50 years. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I love it. I get so much encouragement through the coaching that we get to be a part of with folks because we're the recipient of hearing all the good news and all that God's doing in and through their lives. So that's why we were wanting to get as many people as we can into open slots when coaching opens up. We're filling up a coaching cohort right now. Not sure when the next slots will open, but I'd love to have you in it. If you want to know more about our coaching and how that all works, or if you're pretty sure you're convinced or whatever, either way, you can go over to everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching to learn a lot more about it. Okay. Now, also, I want you to join me on our Facebook group. Everyday Disciple has a Facebook group. So find us there. Go find that. Join the group. We're starting to see more and more conversation around different things connected to, guess what? Everyday Disciple Making. All right. And if you've not subscribed to the show on whatever platform you listen to it on, please do that. We put out new episodes every week, right? There's another episode, another episode. And I want you to to get those, not miss those. So if you've not subscribed, please do that. Well, there's all kinds of devices too. We're in every platform in the world out there. So whatever one you're on. And another thing is if you haven't shared the podcast recently with anybody, either on your Facebook group or just told people about it, or if you're leading a church, maybe put it on the church Facebook group or any of that, please share the podcast so we can bless more people, hopefully, and encourage them to believe what God says is true of them and live making discipleship a lifestyle. Now, let's get to today's topic. We continue, it seems, lately here to be barraged by horrifying statistics regarding the shift in church attendance worldwide. And obviously, in, as an American living here, I pay closest attention to the statistics that reflect our country. But I've noticed that things we're experiencing here as the church is pretty reflective, maybe in slightly different stats, but pretty consistent around the world. And about a week or so back, a report from Pew Research came out. They're a huge research firm 
all kinds of data. It takes forever to do the research they do. But they put out a new, pretty startling uh, report that said Christianity could possibly become a minority religion in the U.S. as early as 2045. And their research found a surge of adults leaving Christianity to become atheist or agnostic or, quote, nothing in particular. Yeah. And maybe that's not surprising, but it wasn't all that long ago where 75, 85, 90% of people would say, oh, yeah, well, we're Christians, regardless of how much they believed really and lived it out. And this report had predicted that if the number of Christians under the age of 30 abandoning their faith accelerates beyond its current pace, which all indicators are at will, that adherence of the, what has been the historically dominant religion in the U.S., is going to become a minority by 2045. Yeah, yikes. And this study noted that approximately 90% of Americans used to identify as Christians back in the early 1990s. That's not that long ago. And the study observed that the number, which includes children, had fallen to only 64% by 2020. Hmm, wow. The number of people in the U.S. who identify as religiously unaffiliated, they said, meanwhile, has skyrocketed. That used to be 16% back in 2007. Like, hey, we're not affiliated, just 16%. To now in 2020, the report said that 29% of people identify as unaffiliated. And I have to believe, I I thought about this quite a bit, actually. This kind of bummed me. This kind of rocked me. I, I have to believe that with such a steep increase in people identifying as unaffiliated it has to do something with the way we've been being or doing the church thing. It really has. And I don't think that there's a star- stark increase in how many people say, no, Jesus ain't real. Don't believe in that guy. Don't see his life as amazing and wonderful. And I know a lot of people who would identify as unaffiliated, but they would still say, oh no, I believe in Jesus for sure. And that's where my forgiveness came from. I think so much of it has to do with what they feel like they're affiliating with and what the culture sees as Christianity and what we're aligned with and our views and politics and all that. And, and some of that's ugly and icky to a lot of people and yeah, and kind of convoluted. And that's the thing they're not wanting to affiliate with. I really think so. And so a lot of dots kind of are starting to connect for me. And a while back, I had a conversation with Heath about how we measure what really is success. And it kind of all has to do with all this too, because if we keep doing things the way we've been doing and what we measure oftentimes equals what we then chase after, of course, right? But if we keep doing things the way we've been doing them, I think that this Pew Research is going to be right on the money, and it's maybe going to even be a darker, worse story. So um, I've been compiling a list for quite a while now of what I think are successful new benchmarks and measurements of a healthy church, a church that believes the gospel and that it applies to all of life and discipleship is our only mission. And I've been compiling that list for a while, and I want to share it with you today in this conversation. I think it may push a few buttons out there. But my goal is not to offend anyone, but I think it's time to start looking at some new, more missional benchmarks of success as the church. So here, take a listen to our conversation. You and I both have a history of working like in a traditional institutional church, and it's safe to say that we've both come quite a way since those days of working in that. But the institution has a way of measuring what they deem to be a success and what you call the three B's. And we kind of <laughs> joke about it, but I think you're right on yeah. with it, right? Let's talk about that. Yeah. And, and some people have quoted me on the three B's, but then they change the B's and all that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've both been around church a long time, like you said, and even worked for sort of traditional institutional churches. But it starts to become uh, uh, like you are very aware on staff of what's being measured. Sure. Right. And um, I remember one time even I was a guy I was coaching and he told me like, oh, here's what here's one of the things we measure. And it is like how happy people are with our ministries, because like our staff, we get our we get small salary and then larger bonuses. Mm -hmm. And our bonuses are based on like how much money comes in every month or every quarter. Yeah. 
like through Weird. giving. Yeah. And so like if you do something like as a youth director or whatever, youth, you know, pastor and like there's upset parents, you'll get talked to by the XP because it's like, <laughs> do you realize they might slow, they might not give anymore. They yep. might stop their giving and like, you're going to kill all of our bonuses, oh, you know, too familiar. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Anyway. So yeah, the three B's, what I say is that most churches tend to measure these, whatever you want to call them. But the three, the three B's are butts, <laughs> a building size and budgets. Okay, so butts are like attendance on Sunday. How many butts in seats? Okay. Right? Building size, that's a big thing. Like, sure. Maybe not to your average attender. I don't know, but like pastors are oh, way yeah. into like, hey, we're putting Counting on the, the new wing. Yep. You know, we got this thing going on. Or Capital this many square feet. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. All that stuff. And then budgets. Everybody will say, like, like I, I've heard this so many times. Like when I was, you know, sort of more involved in the big, big mega church life and consulting there and all, it was like they would say, "Well, what are you running on Sundays?" And they would like uh, they meant attendance. Yeah. Like, what are you running these days? You know, that was always first question. And then they go like, "So, what are you guys running annually?" And they were like, "Want to know the budget?" Hmm. Like, and that was a big thing too. And so, you know, you, you think about those things, butts like attendance, building size, and budgets, and you go like. Does that even line up with like anything we see in scripture? Yeah. I was just thinking as you're talking, I'm like, Jesus didn't seem to have the stress of any of those. You know? In fact, it seems like he ran from some of that. Nor, nor did nor did any any of the church that we see talked about in Acts or in the epistles. Sure. None of that stuff was ever brought up once. Never. Yeah. It's not funny. <laughs> I mean, other than like, and daily numbers were, you know, uh, people were being added to their numbers, but yeah. they were talking about their households. Yeah. Like daily more people were hanging out in their homes. Yeah, not membership numbers. Yeah, yeah all this. <laughs> well, membership, don't get me started, right? <laughs> you know, I find it amazing that, you know, in it's not even in one sense, but in the sense that Jesus was the most successful disciple maker of all time. Absolutely. Yet, here we like, are. 12 no guys. Doubt. Well, 11, really, when it was all over. And here we are, worldwide phenomenon, still. Yeah, still later. He's the best that's ever lived, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yet, based off what you're saying, it doesn't seem like he would even be qualified to be on staff at most institutional churches anymore. No, it's crazy, right? I mean, Jesus was easily and immeasurably the most successful person in human history Hmm. in every way. Yet, if we were to measure his lifetime effectiveness using today's church standards of success for staff and leadership, Jesus would probably find it pretty hard to get hired at most churches. You know, and sure, he could draw a, cl- a crowd, usually around healings and massive meal times, right? L- yeah. Loaves and fishes, thousands of people. Um, yet he primarily spent the bulk of his leadership energy and time with only a dozen people, his disciples. Hmm. And in our modern church, Jesus wouldn't get great marks for that and, and probably not get that promotion up the ladder because senior leadership usually, del- you know, delegates or relegates discipleship to lower team members or a director of discipleship so sorry jesus yeah isn't that funny and you could look at a lot of the different like butts budgets yeah and building size jesus didn't have church building uh no budget yeah (laughs) you know it was completely dependent on others gifts and just hanging out and 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 trusting his father for all the provision in fact when he sent out his disciples he said don't take any extra don't take stuff don't take a purse don't even take extra clothing you're going to be provided for just watch right so none of the three b's would have like jesus would have have been rallying for those you know so i just came out of a church that just finished a six plus million dollar capital campaign and i've been around a lot of senior pastors executive pastors who are so vision like we set vision that's the role of the senior pastor And, and like you're saying Make the disciple makers. We already like, have the vision. Oh my yeah, gosh. I know, right? Like we're spending so much time in it. How do we? Jesus get, gave it to us. You know. How do we get so far away from the source here? I've thought about this a lot, brother. I, I, I don't think it's any one simple reason. Okay. But I, I, if I have to, well, I mean, we can go all the way. We can go all the way back to Constantine, right? <laughs> you know, sure. Around three hundred and all that. But I won't. I'm going to go that far back. I'll say in our lifetime. Okay. I think part of what's really leapfrogged us far away from the source and what what we saw Jesus about in the early church about and what they were measuring is when the church decided that we had to, you know, modernity hit and we had to mm-hmm. kind of start competing with TV and sure. media and concerts and the world yep. and marketing and all this stuff. And, and, and then we started listening to leaders, both secular and Christian leaders that were all about like, Hey, here's the business model that mm-hmm. will totally set your church on fire and turn this around. And a lot of leaders, church leaders, sure. Think seventies, eighties, I'm not going to name names, church growth movement, big, yep. big mega churches. They all started adopting business models. Mm. And business titles and top down leadership yep. and lording over kind of leadership. And I yep. wouldn't call it that, but it's super top down. It, it wasn't it about is, yeah. the 
it wasn't about the priesthood of believers being served sure. by elders and other leaders. It was it was it was really a business model. And I think when the church got away from our identity as family primarily, yeah. and how do we how do we make decisions? Well, how would a healthy family make a decision? Mm. How would a family who's got God as their father, Jesus as their brother, how would we decide who's doing what and yeah. how we spend money and how we bless and wh- wh- what are we prioritizing right now as a family? When we got away from that and got to business, I think we started measuring the three Bs. Hmm. And it makes sense. It worked if that's what you valued. Yeah. But if you valued life and community as a family on mission, that just kept taking us further, yep. further, further away until it started to die. And still, until we started to see, wait a minute, there aren't as many butts and seats. And when there's not as many butts and seats, there's not as much budget, which means we're not building as many buildings. Yeah. So when all these other churches in our city start to bail and die, yeah. well, we'll just scoop them into ours because we got to fill up this big building. You yeah, know? so you have a flux of certain churches. So yeah. now we think, oh, yeah. we got more butts and seats. Yeah, but we just lost four other really, you know, yeah. what used to be healthy communities, serving people, making disciples in the, in the, you know, in the city. Yep. Well, now their butts are in our seats. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Just, just moving them around. Oh, yeah. Now you have uh, this 10 sort of measurements of how a church can test and see if healthy growth is happening. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I, I would argue that your measurements are, are a lot more biblical than what we've seen quite a bit. But do you mind walking through those 10 with yeah, us? Yeah, no, no sweat. And I've actually been kind of accumulating these as we go. You know what I mean? Yeah. In the sense of like, when we first started trying to live like a family missionary servants and, and quote, plant churches that way, sort of an upside down model of like, hey, let's let's live like family. Let's let's see Oikos as the primary organizing structure. We'll st- we're still going to gather up. Like mm-hmm. we're going to gather up and worship and, you know, preach the word hard and all that. But... But um, when we started living that way, we started realizing that, oh, wait a minute, if we're measuring the three Bs, this is not taking us anywhere where we sure. want to go. It just yeah. isn't. And so what are, what if we keep measuring the same old things, we'll keep sort of recreating the same old church, which isn't working really yeah. that well anymore, right? So we're going like, wait a minute, if we want to make disciples who make disciples and live like a family of missionary servants, we're going to have to start measuring some different things. Yeah. But we, we didn't even know what different. they were at first. We huh. really didn't. We're like, well, what do we measure? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so little by little, I started just kind of keeping a list when I go like, oh, that's an important thing to measure. Hmm. And someone would say, hey, you guys seem to really put a lot of focus on this. I'm like, yeah, we, in fact, we do. And like, do you measure it all? Well, some things are very tangibly measurable, sure. like numerically. And other things are more like, oh, that's growing like crazy, isn't it? That's really motivating people. Huh. That's helping people grasp the gospel. And it's not as numerical, sure, but it's very obvious that it's in the up, it's moving upward, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, so I've kind of put together sort of 10, you know, benchmarks, if you will, yeah. of, of a healthy missional church. And what I mean by healthy and missional, both the mission is missional means make disciples, right? So we're focused on what Jesus gave us to do, the yeah. thing that we were created for, saved for, that we get to be the church, the family of God for. And so, in fact, um, I'm going to put it in the, in the show notes. I'm going to share them right now, but like I have got a whole little like 10 missional benchmarks guide. And then there's a little test you can take to see like, where are we at in these? Yeah. And then even a little assessment to kind of say, oh, okay, sweet. let's rate ourselves. Yeah, you know? where we're at. So yeah. We, yeah, exactly. Where we need to grow. So let's start walking through these and you, you know, let, see what you think. Challenge me on them. Uh, give me your thoughts on where we go. Yeah. So the first one, uh, maybe it's super obvious. I don't know, is um, the number of mature disciples being made. I think that's something yeah. worth measuring. You know, disciples make disciples. They don't just hang out or sit in rows together once a week. Yep. And so if you see people who are maturing, maturing in Christ and, and helping others walk in his ways and mature and know him and know the Father and become more, you know, more and more like Jesus, that's what we do as disciples. That is, that is, I think, the top measurement. Yeah, that's great. Right? Yeah. For a while, I'll just be honest, we used to kind of measure like the growth of our missional communities. Okay. And that's not horrible, but that's con- that's the container, just sure. like a building is a container, right? And so I don't think Jesus and, and our Father is about measuring containers. Since Jesus said, "Go and make disciples, fill the world with my glory," I, you know, I I think measuring the number of mature disciples being made that's key. That's great, man. All right, I, I do agree with that. Like, yeah. there's another way around. So I have to put that one first. I yeah. don't know that all of these necessarily are in order of importance, you know, sure. but I have to go with that. So, uh, the second one, I go number of relationships that Christians, you know, in other words, people in the church uh, have with not yet believers, hmm. with not non Christians. Yeah, you know, that, is is ask yourself: is the relational base among those who are not a part of our church is it growing, or are we moving beyond, you know? Uh, 
are, are we yet moving beyond like this tight holy huddle and 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 building true meaningful relationships? I can remember when I was on staff at the mega church, um, I was there almost all the time. Really? I mean, it was six yeah. days a week, and I remember really really being super convicted. You have no relationships with not yet believers. Well, you don't. It's hard to hear. Yeah. You know, like I mean, relationships, people you know, people sure. you do friendships with, you do life with. Yeah. I'm not talking about like, well, I'm pretty sure the guy at the dry cleaners isn't a Christian because you know <laughs> I think he's a Muslim or something. It's like I have a relationship with him. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm talking but about relationships, really yeah. friends, people who invite you over and go, hey, you guys want to go to the beach and mm-hmm. we're going on vacation next month. Uh, you might want to, you know, yep. like relationship. So I think that's also important to remember to 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 sort of measure now there again it might not be as tangible like you're going to hand out lists of people like how many do you have yeah but there's you can definitely get a sense of that who are you hanging out with yep who yep. are you people in your church hanging out with is yeah. it you are you keeping them so busy with programs that they're just at the church the whole time sort of like i said in that holy sure. huddle or are the number of relationships with not yet believers growing that's, that's great, key man. if you lose that missional impulse yeah you need to step back and go We've, Why? we got insular yeah we're yep. ancestral now we need to figure out how to break out of this exactly thing. All right, number three. All right, number three um, is, and these are benchmarks or measurements, right? Measuring the gospel display in and through culture. And what I mean by that is, is our physical proclamation of the gospel expanding through serving others, especially the least of these? Is the good news being demonstrated as good news for today? Wow. So I guess one thing to preach the gospel uh, in a service, and we need to, right? And proclaim the good news but there's another that we're actually out in and through culture displaying the, the results of the good news yeah. in physical proclamations too. Absolutely. Right? You know, uh, when Jesus says, you know, like when someone's hungry, what do you, you, what do you give them? Like a track or in, an invitation to an <laughs> Easter service? No, you, you feed them, yeah. right? A cup of cold water for someone who's thirsty, yep. right? And so is our gospel display of service, because that's part of our gospel identity is servants, yep. is, is, is that growing? Hmm. Are we are we out more serving and displaying the gospel? That's not to the exclusion of of a gospel proclamation. Because sure. in fact, that's number four. Are our gospel conversations growing and taking place naturally? Like, is our verbal proclamation of the good news increasing? Yeah. Are folks growing in their gospel fluency? And we we use that term a lot on the show, but yeah. just to define it again, gospel fluency is the ability to speak and live and enjoy the good news. In every area of life, yep. not just like connected to our afterlife, right? Yeah. Does the gospel come up naturally and often in conversation amongst Christians and they're not yet believing friends in ways that are natural and make sense? Or is it like, no, we really don't talk about that because quote unquote, no one wants to hear it. And so when we do, we finally swallow hard and hand them a little green booklet all crumpled up, you know, with the four <laughs> spiritual flaws. It's like, what? You know, yeah, that's no. quite a jump. It's a good thing to measure. Our gospel conversations yep. taking place naturally. Yeah. I remember years ago, um, we had an intern uh, with us at Soma, yep. and she spent summer with us, and we were having sort of a, like a thanks and you know so long like luncheon at the end of the summer, and she okay. was getting ready to head out. He said, "So, what are some of the things? Like, what surprised you about you know hanging out with us for the last three months, you yeah. know, in the community and kind of serving the, our family?" And she said, "I mean, I don't know, this is not exact words, but she said something like this. She says, here's what surprised me the most." you guys talk about Jesus and the gospel like all the time. It's just huh. kind of part of like life. It just comes up all the time and yeah. not in weird, creepy ways, but you just do. It's just natural. Yeah. And it convicted me. Like I never talk about Jesus or the gospel with people huh. like hardly ever. It's like gotta be like time to do an evangelist, <laughs> you know, presentation, you know? And she says, but it, for you, it, like your family here, you guys as a community, you just, it just rolls out all the time, but yeah. it's not weird. Like it's normal. It's natural. It's a beautiful. We were like, like thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That was surprising to her, but I'm like thankful, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, number five. Number five was one of the first ones we actually kind of started paying attention to. Um, like I said, these aren't necessarily in order, but it, it's something to measure. I think it's really important benchmark is the number of indigenous leaders that are being developed. Okay, unpack that a bit. Yeah. So here's here's the here's the thought: Are are new leaders and teachers and preachers coming to faith through your ministry? You know, and th- it, in other words, they came to faith through you guys, and now they're teaching and preaching and all that. Hmm. You know, um, that's really. Or, good. or are you mostly hiring from outside the family? Yeah, you, know, you get online, you go to WillowNet or whatever Church dot com or whatever, and you go <laughs> yeah. like, "We gotta get a new, you know, children's ministry director. We need a new worship guy, whatever." Yeah, why aren't we developing these people? You know, one of my favorite sermon series that Soma did was when I first moved here, they did a whole summer and uh, they picked like 12 or 15 
people that felt like they had the gifting of, of preaching or teaching and they gave each one of them a week and and uh at that time you were in new york but jeff sat with them and he walked through like awesome. let's, let's walk through your sermon and then you had 12 guys that we actually as a, as a body were able to affirm like hey absolutely this is your gifting let's, yeah. let's get you up here more Isn't that it was amazing? just really beautiful yeah it wasn't for the rock star past and it's not just teaching but like you know our our indigenous leaders being developed through your ministry in other words they they're here they're local yep. they came to know christ through us They've been discipled to maturity, and now they're leading others, and they're passing on those same yeah, gifting cool. and skills, you know, to others. Yeah. That is super important because the reason I love that one yep. is that one seems to kind of indicate that a lot of other stuff is firing. Sure, like well, you're not developing in a sense, yeah, exactly. You're not developing indigenous leaders if you're not doing discipleship. Yeah, and you're not doing evangelism. Well, if there's no, you know, you're not going to have yeah. new leaders that are indigenous and they're not coming to faith, which means you're never proclaiming anything either yeah. in word or action and deed, right? So that one is key. Yeah, so it's right it's in the beautiful. middle of the list, number five. <laughs> no, I, lo- I do love too that it's not just the same two or three people leading all uh, the professionals leading the service. You know, you get the flair of. It always killed me, like in a mega church, and, and we've been a part of them, and like even like with giant churches there again that we maybe all would know. And I knew a lot of the leadership. It's like, why is every time they need another teaching pastor or even a small groups pastor or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's always like they got to hire and rob it from another church. Yeah. You, you got 20,000 people here <laughs> in your church. 30 get your years. Culture you haven't developed one. There. Yeah. Not, not one guy can preach. Nope. Yeah. Not one gal can get up and lead something. Like what? Fail. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fail. That's Come a on. That's a crazy fail. fail. Yeah. yeah. So, oh gosh. Anyway. Forgive yeah. us Lord. Number yeah, six. Exactly. Number six. Um, measuring this is important. Multiplication of missional and discipleship communities. Yep. So healthy things grow. And if we're making disciples who make disciples, the number of our missional communities, they will be expanding and growing. Yeah. And we saw that we saw that consistently. If we, number five, were developing indigenous leaders that could lead new communities and help people become disciples and then apprentice more people. We saw a multiplication of missional communities. And like I said, that's not primary only measurement tool, like to measure the containers, but we live in family groups. We live in community, right? That's life. It's good. And it's important. And you can't make disciples to maturity outside of community. And so that's an important one. Like, you know, I've seen churches where it's like, well, we've got sort of three missional communities. Two of them kind of suck. One of them is pretty legit. (laughs) How long you had that many? 20 years, 10 years, five years now. Um, I, I worked with a community for a while that had um, literally 80 sort of house churches slash mission communities. So, okay. Wow, that's a that's a ton. Healthy things always grow. I mean, you guys are going to be at like 160, 200 pretty soon. Like, now we've been at 80 for like five, six years. Oh, wow. Now, 80 is great, yeah. but apparently something's not growing, multiplying yeah. there. So probably back to number five, they're not developing leaders, you know, all that, right? <laughs> yeah. And 80% of those are closed groups. Oh boy. Let me, let me keep going. We're running, <laughs> yeah, we're running along here. Number seven, um, measuring ministry ownership levels are going up amongst the saints, you know, meaning are people increasingly willingly taking on the responsibility for every area of life and ministry as a community or congregation? Hmm. So it's not just that 80, 20 thing, but yeah. are, do you see more and more percentages of people going like, this is my family. Like, what do you need? You know, watching kids, you know, teaching ownership, kids, yeah. teaching, preaching, cleaning the building, doing the stuff. It's like, oh, we got, you know, we got an $80,000 budget a year to cut the grass. Yeah, you got 20,000 people here. Someone can cut the grass. <laughs> you know? yeah. I don't know, whatever, right? You know, no, but our, our ministry ownership levels, and, and I use that word because it's like, you know how it is, we, we all treat like place we live different if we're renting versus yeah. owner yeah. <laughs> you know oh yeah it's like i want owners man i yeah. want people to see this this is my family yeah. this is our ministry we're taking this city like mm. we're going to transform this yeah that's good it's the buy-in right yeah, number eight exactly number eight is um five-fold maturity which is you know are your are there maturing leaders being allowed to lead in all five of the key giftings that are outlined in ephesians 4 you know, we call okay. it fivefold ministries, yep. you know? So are you seeing apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers both maturing but given, like, permission to lead? Hmm. This is so key to maturity throughout the entire church. And I don't have time to do a study on Ephesians 4, but most churches, you know, that I've been a part of and grown up, you, you couldn't even point out a staff member much less somebody you go like, oh man, they're super involved in the church that was crazy mature and equipping others in all five of those areas. Sure. We mostly have, we usually have pastors and teachers. That's it. Yeah. 
and no one else is kind of allowed to do anything. <laughs> it's like that. Well, they might have a bit of a prophetic gift, or that guy kind of likes to do evangelism. Like, no, no, these are gifts. These are the gifts that are people that are given to the church for the maturing of the saints and unity in Christ. That we we need all five. So, yeah, are you do. measuring that? And if you see a lack, don't don't be content. Yep. <laughs> Figure it out. Go after it. D- develop people. Give people permission to lead and to grow in their gifting. Just like you know, we say, well. Yeah, but if, if it's really God's anointing, you know, and they're a prophet, it's going to be spot on from the get-go. Wait a minute. You're a teacher. You're a preacher. Was your preaching, like, just nailing perfect at the <laughs> Solid beginning? Solid B+. Plus. No yeah. way. Yeah. No. Like, everybody, like, I, listen back to your earliest stuff. It's like heresy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, not, it's not that good, and it's not even that accurate, right? Yeah. Okay, number nine. Number nine. Um, measuring the priesthood of all believers engaged in every area of ministry and mission. Ooh, that's good. Okay. Another thing we learn from Ephesians 4 is that Leaders are to equip the saints for the ministry and acts of service. I kind of mentioned that a minute ago. Um, Leaders are not to be doing all the ministry. So you look at a staff and they do everything, and then you got a ton of volunteers kind of just to fill in blanks and set up chairs and stuff like that. Look across your church or community. Who's doing most of the teaching and preaching and counseling and strategic planning and all that? Hmm. Is it paid or non-paid people? Is it mostly men? You know, what about the women? Yeah, how diverse is what it? What about yeah. teens and kids? Are they engaged in the ministry? Do you actually believe in the priesthood of all believers? And is it are is their engagement growing in every area of ministry, hmm. not just in sort of the lesser areas? You know, sure, like kids ministry and youth ministry and setting up chairs <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, or is it every area of ministry? Yeah, that's good. Remember, it's the priesthood of believers here. Priesthood, yeah, same all hands on deck, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. then number ten is measuring people who are sent. To start new works and new church plants. You know, it should be the most normal thing for a church or a missional community to be sending their folks out to start new communities, new churches. Yeah. In other words, are we raising the kids to move out? Mm. <laughs> See, multiplication always beats addition. So that's an important thing to measure. Churches that haven't planted a new church or started new works in like years or decades, that's not healthy. Yeah, there's an issue there. That's yeah. not that's not healthy. There should be, because guess what? Healthy things always grow. Yep. They do. So, you know, if the ways that we're teaching and preaching and making disciples disciples is not being easily reproduced to the third and fourth generation and then beyond, well, then we've got some rethinking to do. Yeah. We're probably not measuring the things that add up to that kind of multiplication. So anyway, I'll, there's the 10 benchmarks, man. Caesar, I'll take your 10 over, over the three we started out with. <laughs> I know three is easier to remember, right? <laughs> but 10, start a pick one. Yeah, so you can download the free assessment and the full 10 benchmarks by going to everydaydisciple.com forward slash benchmarks. If you want to get this thing, and I think you do, you want to get it, trust me, get this, print it off, maybe read it at your next staff meeting or with your elders. There's a little assessment you can do there. And then watch what people say. What do, you know, what's going on? What do you guys think? And how are we doing on this number or number three or number seven? Or how are we doing on this one? And they're all biblical. I didn't make those up. This is all stuff you see going on in the early church for a long time, right? In the first century and how Jesus was with his disciples. So trust me, you're going to want to check that out. Again, you can just get it at everydaydisciple.com forward slash benchmarks, plural, like that. Okay, well, now, as always, I want to leave you with the big three takeaways from our talk today. If nothing else, don't want to miss these. And you can get that, and I'll put the link to the free benchmarks in there as well, but you can get the big three and that link. Just go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash big three. That's the number three. All right. Caesar, what are the big three for this week? All right. Um, if nothing else, don't miss these. Okay. First thing, measuring things that Jesus never measured will not grow his church. Mm. Amen. It, it might for a season or seem like it is, but it's, it's really, it's, it's a waste of time. Yep. <laughs> and it leads to burnout. Okay. I'm just going to say that. So loving and treating others like family, proclaiming and demonstrating the good news, serving the least in our midst, inviting people to walk in the ways with Jesus with us in every area of life, that's discipleship. Yeah. Those are the things on God's hearts and that will change this world. Yeah. Start to measure those kind of things, really, please. Yep, that's a sustainable way. Yeah, yeah. please do. Number two. Second thing, don't miss this. God's love for us, his children, goes well beyond how often you know, individually, each of us attend a church service or how much we throw in the offering each week. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those are important things, but, but that our, his love goes so far beyond that. Yeah. Our father sent his son to rescue us and transform our lives. And it cost Jesus his life that we might have true life. Yeah. And his desire is for us to also lay down our lives for others 
under the Father's glory and be super engaged in this mission. Yeah, you're right. We man. get to measure those things. You know? Yeah, we don't have to feel the guilt of it. No. Yeah. Absolutely. Because his love is not, yeah, it's not due to be his love. No, is. absolutely. Bingo. Right yeah. there. Number three. Okay, number three. Figure out what you've been currently given the most measurement, weight, and attention to in your church or community and see if it aligns with true gospel-centered, disciple-focused, missional health. Okay. And if it's not producing mature disciples, it's time to get serious about changing it, really, like yeah. today, now. The church only has one true mission, and that's go and make disciples that make disciples. So let's reorient our measurements of success around that, okay? Please. Yeah. It's the way Jesus told us to do it in the first place. And again, you can get the big three for this week by going to everydaydisciple.com forward slash big three. B-I-G, the number three. And again, if you get that download of the big three, there'll also be the link to that e-guide of the 10 benchmarks and that assessment. You can get that for yourself, print that off. It's really quite a booklet. There's a lot there. It's not just a list of 10 items. It's a whole assessment and test, and it'll help you walk your people through that. So I I hope you'll get that. Again, just go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash big three get the big three get the link to the assessment and i hope you'll join me next week we're kind of out of time today next week we'll be talking about why church elders should be lead disciple makers yeah not just a once a month meeting type of thing or in charge of a lot of quote important stuff but shouldn't our church elders be lead disciple makers i think so anyway i think you'll like it i'll talk to you soon Thanks for joining us today. For more information on this show and to get loads of free discipleship resources, visit everydaydisciple.com. And remember, you really can live with the spiritual freedom and relational peace that Jesus promised every day.